Welcome to the final lecture on strategic management. Back to our strategic planning cycle, and we look at number six at the top. We, we assess and adjust as an ongoing process, and we reassess the, the macro environment, the industry, but certainly with an eye to our customers and whether this strategy that we've chosen is helping to delight them. I mentioned that the SWOT, which we're all very familiar with, can be an interesting way or a really handy way to make the transition from the analysis to the strategic recommendations and the formulation of strategy. Remembering, of course, that the S and the W, the strength and the weaknesses, are an internal look at the company. The opportunities and threats are a summary of the external uh, conditions. And then putting those together into a toes matrix, we look at listing the strengths and the weaknesses, opportunities and threats, and then finding those areas where we can leverage strengths, current strengths to take advantage of opportunities, where we can leverage current strengths to mitigate threats, um, where we realize we may have a weakness we need to shore up in order to take advantage of an opportunity, or where a weakness may make us vulnerable to existential threats through our comp for our company. So once we've completed the toes matrix, it should be fairly obvious what stands out as the most compelling way forward. Now, it, it's again, it's strategy, so there's, there's no absolute right answer, but going through this process will at least enable you as a strategist, as a CEO, to hone in on some, some you know, really good options and have a good test case uh, for how, you know, for making these decisions uh, and then be able to make those, you know, make the, make the ultimate decision and accept the trade-offs that are the result um, of strategy, the opportunity costs, the potential expenditure of resources and capabilities towards a direction. So, now we're ready to formulate our strategy and really basically dividing it between corporate strategy and business unit strategy. When we ask the question on the left side, how do we make money? We're really looking at two different things, aren't we? How attractive is the industry? And then how do we gain competitive advantage within that industry? So corporate strategy asks the question of, looks at industry attractiveness and asks the question of which businesses should we be in? And then once we've made that decision on the corporate level, now the business unit areas, from a competitive advantage standpoint, ask the questions of, okay, now we've decided where we should compete, how should we compete within those industries? Some of the key questions when we formulate strategy that need to be answered. The first and probably one of the most difficult at times is the make or buy decision. Do we do something internally or do we outsource it? Um, we talked about the value chain in a lot of detail last, um, last lecture and we'll continue to build it forward as we talk about integration to different parts of the value chain. But are we better off engaging in integration or outsourcing, say for example, our distribution? Um, our, our after-sales service or whatever aspect of the value chain it might be. Remembering, of course, that when we outsource, we've potentially saved money, we've potentially avoided risk associated with those activities, but we've also hollowed out our capabilities. We no longer are up to date on that aspect of providing value to our customers. So the make or buy decision, there's an entire um, field of strategy called transaction cost economics where we weigh the relative costs of the transactions um, and the contracts and the lawyer the legal fees uh, that are involved in those contracts we, we evaluate all of the, the the various costs with outsourcing buying versus uh, uh, accepting all the risk internally We've discussed this previously. Is it best to be, or is there more advantage being a first mover or a fast follower? Uh, we've read a we've read an article on blue ocean strategy, creating an entirely new industry. 
certainly we've looked at some, that's a, that can be a great option. We've looked at some examples like Cirque du Soleil who have done that successfully. It's, it's difficult to do, um, but when you can find that blue ocean and be the first mover to that new industry, there's a, there's a lot of opportunities there um, due to the lack of competition. Now, remember the, if you recall from the earlier discussion, remember the key in order to be a, in order to be effective at a first mover strategy, you need to build in some sort of sustainability, whether it's customer switching costs or um, intellectual property or access exclusive access to resources or asset specificity or something that enables you to hold on to that position. Because I tell you, there will be a big company coming behind you quickly if that industry or if that opportunity looks to have potential. There will be someone with a lot of resources, with a with a strong balance sheet, as a fast follower coming in quickly, and a lot of times, as a big organization, as a big corporation, a fast follower strategy strategy can be more effective because you allow someone else to take the risk as the first mover, and then you can sweep in with greater uh, resources and ability to scale. A big question, obviously, in strategy formulation is how do you deploy resources and capabilities? And I mentioned trade-offs before. We know that when we're, when we're setting a strategic course, that means that resources and capabilities need to be diverted to that course, which means that they won't be able to be spent elsewhere. And we're going to ask questions of integration and diversification that involve those resources and capabilities later. Do we engage in some sort of a merger, acquisition, joint venture, alliance? Um, are there opportunities with complementary products, with suppliers, with competitors to potentially uh, develop new markets or penetrate or, or new products? I guess and I, I've skipped ahead a bit. The, the last question is whether it is about developing new products or new markets. Um, and there's, uh, I want to discuss the rel briefly the relative. So then let's dive a little bit deeper into integration and diversification. Why do it? Why choose an integration or diversification strategy? Well, um, specifically to expand the scope of operations, to shore up marketing, market position, to enhance purchasing power, and to spread risk. Those are the largest reasons. Um, some are more viable than others between the two. But ultimately, that's what we're after. How do we do it? As I mentioned before, we're redeploying ass resources, capability, assets. And we're also taking a portfolio approach. Again, wearing the, the hat of a, of a corporate CEO, of a conglomerate. We want to treat our business units just as a financial manager would the asset classes that he's investing his clients or her clients' dollars in, right? Just as there are you know, emerging markets and, and, and penny stocks and traditional equity that may, you know, they're, you know, dividend yield versus high growth versus bonds versus treasury bills. We have a whole scope of um, different risk classes for assets for financial managers. We need to treat our business units the same way. We have business units that are in high growth industries. We have business units that are in very stable industries, right? We have some that are, have achieved sort of maturity in their life cycle. We have, and maybe are on the downhill side. Maybe they're cash cows. We have some that are sort of these rising stars in these industries with a lot of potential. So we look at our, uh, we look at keeping a balanced portfolio in strategy just as we do in finance. And so what are we after through integration and diversification? Uh, we talked about why to do it, but what advantage does it provide, I guess is a better way to say the what. Um, in addition to the, in, the scope and scale, it also is these strategies are influential in creating social complexity and causal ambiguity. By those, I mean it's very difficult for our competitors to be able to even understand sometimes how our advantage is gained, how we're able to perform in that market, and then what sort of social, what sort of networks, what sort of relationships have we built that have enabled us to be successful in these space, either up and down the value chain, uh, or horizontally through our up for, through our industry, and or 
even in unrelated business segments. So more specifically in integration, there's two types, horizontal and vertical. Horizontal integration looks at you know, so equivalent opportunities within sort of related uh, aspects of the value chain. So for example, Coca-Cola is the example here. Um, as Coca-Cola's coming out and, and they've got distribution systems set up and bottling plants set up uh, to deliver their Coke product to retail outlets, well, it's only natural that they can add on other um, beverages to those uh, to those runs, right, and to the and to those plants. So Snapple, Dasani, all of the others that they've they've gotten into. Vertical integration would be going through the value chain. This is where we're really trying to drive down costs through the value chain. We're not taking on additional products or services necessarily. We're either going backward to our raw materials or forward toward our end users at the end of the value chain and the customer, the retail, and then the customer service side. So if we're sticking with Coke here, they are probably somewhere in an operational area, somewhere in the middle. Coke's primary business is the, is the production of the formula and then, and then bottling distri you know, and distribution. So they were pro if, if we had to say, they're probably more forward uh, integrated than backwards because they don't own the sugar beet farms, for example. So if, if Coke was to choose a backwards vertical integration strategy, they would consider buying those farms. As I said, they're pretty far forward, and I would say they're even further forward than disk distribution because they also have exclusive agreements um, with retailers. You can't, for example, go into uh, you can't go into McDonald's and get a Pepsi or a Pepsi product uh, because Coke has that agreement um, pretty well laid out. So they're about as far forward as you can get um, from a vertical integration standpoint. <clears throat> Here is the big idea, however. The goal of integration is really to achieve scope and scale advantages. Whether that's horizontal or vertical, uh, the goal is to in, in, in achieve those advantages. Diversification, the goal is different. We'll get to that in a second, but what is it? There's two types of diverse, diversification I want to talk about as well. Related, which is... Uh, expanding into product lines or services or new markets that have similarly configured value chains to yours, where you leverage those, remember, specific capabilities I talked about before. And here's some other examples of them, technology, industry know-how, that sort of thing. Uh, an example here would be Pepsi, right? Pepsi um, opted to jump into a whole variety of other products. Now, we can discuss whether... Well, I'll, I'll come to that in a second, but the products, Gatorade, Fritos, Quaker Foods, Cheetos, um, they're already heading out to the stores. Why not add in other snack goods that are going to be uh, sold alongside of them? Now, you may ask the question, and this is what I was wanting to come back to, uh, what is the difference between unrelated, or excuse me, uh, related diversification and horizontal integration? Well, it's really about the motivation behind it. As I said, um, as I said that integration, the goal of integration is to take advantage of or create economies of scope and scale. The purpose of diversification, just like in an asset class for finances, um, is to spread risk. So it's really about the motivation behind the decision. Then unrelated diversification competing in unrelated markets with dissimilar value chains, these rely on those generalized capabilities. So the general versus specific. Is there a brand that can be leveraged, right? You have, are, are we really good at operational efficiencies and disciplined execution? Uh, examples of unrelated diversification are most of your uh, large conglomerates, your Tatas, your P&Gs, your Berkshire Hathaways. Look at the product lines that they have. Everything from Ellsberg Diamonds to Dairy Queen to... BNSF, right? Uh, 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 and, you know, so these generalized capabilities that help them be successful uh, in, in a variety of different industries. And again, the goal of diversification, important distinction, integration, scope and scale, diversification to spread risk. 
Okay, so obviously we have the two options um, of strategy formulation, integration and diversification we've talked about. Now let's talk about market development. Say our strategy is that we want to increase the amount of potential customers for our product or service. Um, and let's talk about international competition specifically. Well, there's a number of ways to get there. We can, we can export, and these really are going to run um, low to high in almost, almost, direct, almost linearly low to high in terms of both low risk to high risk, low control to high control. And I'll explain a little more of that in a minute. But we can light, we can uh, export goods is the quickest, easiest way. Then we simply um, obviously ship our goods. We pay shipping costs, some excise taxes. We deal with exchange rates, but it's the but it's the quickest and easiest way um, to 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 ship a good or to expand your market. Um, the risk there, once it's exported, there's no protections on that product, whether it's uh, reverse engineered or um, a company that you're exporting it to decides they want to, uh, you know, especially we have to be careful of this in some Asian countries, um, steal the intellectual property. Another option is to sign licensing agreements and ask foreign firms to produce and distribute your good. We could franchise in foreign markets. A little bit, uh, a little bit riskier, but not not incredibly risky as we are leveraging someone else's capital, um, the franchisor. A greenfield venture. A greenfield venture means simply starting up a subsidiary business in that country. Um, this can be obviously a bit riskier. It can take a bit more time, but the control is 100% there. We also, though, don't have the ability or the advantage as we would with an acquisition of being able to retain local expertise. If we're acquiring a, f a foreign firm, there are going to be employees with that firm, existing relationships with that firm, and it can make, especially in some more volatile uh, economies and countries, it can make the process of opening that market up much easier than a greenfield venture, for example could also engage an alliance or a joint venture with a foreign firm. <clears throat> Transaction costs on that, if you recall that conversation, that's much higher. And all of these options really need to be evaluated from a strategic standpoint based on how much control you need over your business. Is there, a, uh, you know, is, is there intellectual property that you're worried about losing? It needs. They can be. They need to be evaluated for the speed. How quickly is it? Uh, are you? Does it matter that you get your product and service overseas? Cost, and then obviously any protections for your business. How a, a little heuristic about how to answer some of those questions is right here. What is the pressure for global integration on the y-axis, and what's the pressure for local responsiveness? on the x-axis. What I mean by that, think about it in terms of market segmentation. Do and and, and your product is a um, is your product going to be sufficient or uh, desirable in every marketplace? You know, if we pick on Starbucks for example, is Starbucks coffee going to be um, valued the same way it is in the U.S. everywhere else um, because that should help drive your decision about how you set up and how you enter foreign markets and I'll come back to that example in a minute but if your pressure for globally retaining the same brand the same identity the same exact uh, features of your product overseas, if that pressure is low, if it's on the weaker end, the bottom left, and the pressure for local responsiveness is also low, meaning that there's not a lot of follow-up service and, and customers there don't need uh, a lot of um, a, a lot of feedback and, and you know loops with the product, then an export strategy where you simply sell it overseas might be the way to go. Let's go up to the top and, and look at 
pressure for local responsiveness. There's not a lot of the market segmentation. Your product is going to be relatively the same overseas as it is domestically. So there's not a lot of pressure to change uh, to local tastes. And you have a lot, but you do have a lot of pressure to retain the global brand, the global image. You would choose the global strategy. This is Starbucks. Um, this has been Starbucks MO as they've expanded overseas. A Starbucks coffee and a Starbucks experience feels relatively the same and tastes relatively the same no matter where you get it. Advantages and disadvantages of that. For example, the Australians don't like Starbucks coffee and they've had a very difficult time breaking into that market. Down on the bottom right quadrant, if you are entering into a foreign market where, in, where, where specific tastes are very different than in, in, the, in your home market, um, and you can reduce some of the pressures for having a brand and a, and a, and a feature set and a flavor, if you will, um, everywhere in the world that's identical, you can choose a multi-domestic strategy, which basically says if a global strategy means that if a global strategy means that the, the, the company maintains control over everything everywhere, the multi-domestic strategy affords local managers wherever they might be around the world the ability to tailor their product, tailor their services, uh, whatever they offer to the local um, <clears throat> customer demands. And then finally on the top right, the transnational strategy um, where we have stronger pressure for local responsiveness and stronger pressure, pressure for global integration, meaning that we don't want to lose our global brand, but we still want to be responsive to local tastes. Um, that's where we would end up. Why do we, why do we not see all companies choose that? Because it's in reality very difficult to implement. You're in a situation then where who gets to who gets to uh, mediate disputes? If you've got, uh, you know, if I've got a uh, if I've got a, a business unit in India, for example, and my company's based here in the states, and and the managers in India see a need to move in this direction, and the folks in the states, you know, don't see that. Who who gets to mediate? Who gets to win out in that uh, dispute? And it becomes a very difficult thing in practice to implement a transnational strategy. Not impossible, um, but these are the major considerations: is how much domestic responsiveness do you need versus a global con global consistency and a global brand. Okay, so then as we're look, looking uh, to move internationally, we, we need to understand a bit, and these are just a small, this is a small list, but we need to understand a bit about the risks. There's economic risks. There's tariffs potentially, certainly exchange rate risks, shipping risks. Uh, some, bus some businesses uh, have, sub have subsidies from their local governments that become difficult to compete with, and, and losing out on intellectual property is, of course, a risk. And then on the political side, there are plenty of risks here too. Um, there may be restrictions on imports and exports. There may be minority ownership rights. A country may say um, that, sure, come on over here and start your business. Whether it's a greenfield venture, acquire one of our companies, we're open to having you come into our country and do business, but the stipulation is that uh, a, a, a local resident has to own 51% or more of the company. Is that something you're will, a risk you're willing to take? Profit repatriation limits. Uh, this is another common example where a country may say, come on over, we don't even care if you own 100% of the company that you open in our borders, but only 10% of the profits are able to leave our boundaries, <clears throat> our borders. Regulatory approvals can be, you know, can vary wildly between countries and there are certainly different privacy, environmental, and other regulations to consider. And then the last thing I will talk about in this lecture is once we've established our strategy and we're ready to execute and we're ready to say we're accept the trade-offs, um, go in this direction and provide a mechanism to assess whether or not we've, you know, we're hitting the benchmarks we need and then be able to reassess that strategy over time. Now it's time to execute on that strategy. So how do we do that? First of all, as I've said before, we need to deploy 
our resources and capabilities in that direction. We can talk about what our strategy is, but the real strategy is ends up where you where you deploy your most valuable resources and capabilities, your most talented people, your hard-earned capital, um, and, and the like. So where do we deploy? Then if we just kind of go clockways around from the top, um, setting up an organizational structure, if it's a project structure, if it's a new business unit structure, uh, whatever that is to achieve the goal, allocating resources we've talked about, instituting policies and procedures, adopting best practices and business continu or, uh, continuous improvement processes, right? These are, these are things from an operational standpoint that need to get um, instituted. Information systems, operating systems that can support execution. The next one to the, the at probably about seven o'clock here on the list, rewards and incentives. This is one I want to talk about briefly here because many companies, this is a it's a it's a really difficult thing, and many companies fail um, to achieve a strategy because they don't properly align incentives for performance towards that strategy. If you want to incentivize team behavior, if you want a team-based approach to something, well, you ought to have your annual reviews done on a team and not as an individual, right? Raises ought to happen for a team, um, not for an individual, for example. Instilling a corporate culture that promotes strategy execution, very important. If culture isn't developed, it will, by you as a leader, it will be developed for you. So importantly, um, having, having considerations for culture through the process are important. And then leadership and staffing the organization with the right people. These are the main pillars of strategic execution that can help carry your company forward. And then when it's all said and done, we come